All right, welcome everybody to the Neon Museum's 2020 Resident Artist Talk. This is our first time we've been conducting the Artist Talk via webinar, so it's wonderful to have folks from all over the place joining us today. So thank you so much for being here. So I'm Jo Russ, the Arts Programs Manager at the Neon Museum. Just to give you a brief um, introduction to our residency program, which is now in its fifth year. We invite artists to submit proposals for a interactive um, program where they engage with our local community and take inspiration from our collection and also from the wonderful city of Las Vegas. So this year has been a little unique, shall we say. So we are beginning the residency with a remote aspect and then our artists will be joining us here in Las Vegas and will be accommodated in the wonderful dual residencies La, um, Las Vegas downtown and will be creating an installation for the museum's NET studio. There will be a final open studio event to give you all um, a look at what our artist has been creating and that will be happening on Thursday, December the 17th. So this program is supported in part by the Nevada Arts Council, a state agency which receives support from the National Endowment for the Arts, the federal agency and the state of Nevada. The Neon Museum would also like to acknowledge the generous support of dual residences and our education partnership with Nevada State College and the College of Southern Nevada. So just before I introduce our 2020 residency artist, for those who are not so familiar with the Neon Museum, our collection specialist Emily Falmer will give you a brief overview. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Joe. Yes, so the Las Vegas has been very well known for its shimmering lights and glowing neon signs. Starting in the 1980s and 90s, a lot of long running properties in Las Vegas began to close down and eventually a lot of the buildings and signs were lost. In an effort to preserve this important part of our local history and art forms, um, the Allied Arts Council of Southern Nevada and preservationists began to save neon signs um, for future generations. The museum um, officially opened in 1996. Um, the roots of it really did go back to the Allied Arts Council. Um, the museum is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to collecting, preserving, studying, exhibiting um, iconic Las Vegas neon signs for educational, historic arts and cultural enrichment. Our main exhibition space is called the Boneyard. Um, this is very remnant of what old sign companies would have. Um, they would tend to lease out signs to properties. And once that lease was over, the sign would return back to their storage site. Um, sign companies such as the Young Electric Sign Company really did help bring in a lot of signs to, in the early years of the museum. We also are open um, in our main boneyard space daily for guided tours and general admission. We also have a virtual option to tour this space. Nightly, we also have our um, brilliant exhibition that was designed and created by visual artist, digital and visual artist, Craig Winslow. To learn more about the Neon Museum, um, please go to our website at neonmuseum.org. Thank you so much. Thanks, oh, yes. So it is now my utmost pleasure to introduce the Neon Museum's 2020 Artist in Residence, renowned visual artist, photographer, and writer, Victor Ehi Kamenor. A 2016 Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Fellow, Victor Ehi Kamenor was one of three artists to represent Nigeria at the first Nigerian Pavilion and the 57th Venice Biennale in 2017. His work's been featured in numerous biennales, including the fifth Mediations Biennale in Poznan, Poland, 
2016, and the Biennale Georgia the 18th Indonesia 2015, and exhibited in London, Lagos, and Washington, DC. As a writer, he has published both fiction and critical essays with academic journals, mainstream magazines, and newspapers around the world, including the New York Times, BBC, CNN Online, Washington Post, AGNI, and Wasafiri. He is the founder of Angels and News, a thought laboratory dedicated to the promotion and development of contemporary African art. He received his MFA from the University of Maryland College Park. So Mr. Victor Ehi Kamano, I would like to officially welcome you as the Neon Museum's fifth National Residency Artist, and thank you for taking the time to share your artist talk with us today. And for folks um, who have some questions about the talk, um, you are very welcome to enter those in the chat, and we will leave some time uh, to answer those at the end. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Thank you, Joran. Um, much appreciated for, for that introduction. And also would like to thank the Neo Museum for selecting me as their 2020 um, you know, artist in residence, which is um, 2020 we would say has been an interesting, has been an interesting year to say the least in different ways. And um, it's been a drag, but I'm glad we are here finally <laughs> to, to to kick off this uh, residency, you know. So um, I'm gonna quickly go through some of my works, very selected so that we have, because of the limitation of time, I'm gonna go through them really quickly and how, how they anchor what I do, you know, so and how uh, some of the works um, can be referenced in, in the sense that why did I choose Neo Museum to be one of my first uh, museum residency in, in, in the US, you know, so which is, uh, you know, I'm grateful for. The first image that you are seeing on the screen is, is what I call the, um, the family tree, which is uh, my grandfather there. And um, I grew up with so many grandmothers in a, a typical uh, family that you would see, which is not unusual, you know. So my grandma is there somewhere in the picture. My mom is there in the picture, you know. So I usually start this off because you have to know where you are coming from. Otherwise, you won't know where you are going, you know. So and um, growing up uh, in, in a huge compound, uh, we have we had a lot of art uh, growing up, both inside and outside. We had, you know, outdoor sculptures, you know, so as well as stories. My grandmother's told me stories in the evenings, you know, so, you know, instead of listening to radio or you are watching TV that you would see these days or even a little bit back then, they would tell you stories or tell you about about creation stories. We, we had our own stories, you know, so uh, from the age of would say four to maybe about 10, this is this was normal or even to your early teenage would whereby stories were told to you. So how do you, what do you do with all these things that you consume if you, are, if, if you are a kid? So I started drawing things at the age of four, just me making some of the drawings that I would see on walls and stuff like that. And I never really stopped. Uh, also the writing aspect is that um, I learned to start writing early because some of the older women or men in the community would come to you to write letters for them to their folks in the city, you know. So you are in, you are being told something in your traditional language, in your what we call vernacular. Um, then you translate to English, and write it all out, and you are the one that is going to mail it. So as a kid, you are privy to some informations and and knowledge and and proverbs and and really deep stories that that maybe as a child you are not supposed to, but you know that as a as a writer you are privileged to these things. So they, they, they give you this uh, information, you write them down. Sometimes when the letters get replied, you have to read it back for them because, you know. So that actually began, you know, you could say that I started drawing at the age of four, then I started writing, you could say around between nine and 10 when I could uh, read and write properly. Then I started writing for, for, for my grandmother, my grandfathers and stuff like that, you know, so. Um, that is that is starting from the beginning, you know, so which is a while back. Next slide, please, Randy, Steve. So how do 
some of the things that you experience in uh, growing up influence you um, not just within my locality but within um, the community and beyond just you know one could grow up in the village but our our world is bigger than the little village that you are growing up in because you also consume other culture and stuff like that by traveling, by going out, by going to different festivals and, 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 and those, those kind of uh, situations. So um, I started when I moved from like drawings and, and, and other form of 2D arts, I now start referencing some of those things that I consumed growing up. Like this is a tall masquerade, which is known as the Gunoko in a, in some part of Nigeria. So how do you bring contemporary things into things that were, uh, that are normally traditional, you know? So, you know, because I mean, the people that made them, like people that create masquerades in the village are artists as well, you know? So, but it's just that they were not called artists. So how do you kind of bring that to a contemporary situation whereby you recreate what they have created because you have observed uh, the way we learn, um, from growing up, you know, so that's one of them, you know, so next. Um, so most of my iconography, like I said, I've been drawing since I was four. Um, they are pretty much the same thing, but you just increase the, the knowledge of it. It's like learning how to write, like learning calligraphy. Of course, we are talking about fonts and stuff in, in dealing with, in writing design, design culture in, uh, in, in Vegas, you know, so we also had our sign culture, you know, so um, by the time you keep doing it, because we mentioned, we were having earlier conversation, you mentioned some of the well-known sign designers in, in Vegas, that is the same way ours date back to centuries that we, we have a sign writing system that was also a writing system that has now become a visual system, you understand, you know, so we, in, in doing sign, in writing sign, we started quite early uh, without naming them in that sense of the word, whereby you would name your fonts now, but we had our own naming system. We have our own communication system that has become more visual for me right now than actually the written uh, aspect of things. Next one, please. Steve? Yeah. So moving that writing sign to what people could call political. I mean, I don't know if, if one can just like come out and say, okay, he's a political artist, but if you grew up in a political environment and some of the influences that are there and some of the, if you are an artist and you are supposed to be the mirror of the society, there are things that will be happening around you that you have to reference, you know? So um, this installation is called Wealth of Nation, which uh, speaks to the, um, the oil that is found in Nigeria. We, we first discovered oil in 1956 in, 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 um, in commercial quantity, you know. So the question is, what have we done with it? Has it been a blessing or a cause, you know? So when I first installed this in, um, in Indonesia in 2015, it was made to drip oil from the, from the middle barrel to see how long it would take before the water trough at the bottom get all uh, polluted, you know, so within 48 hours, that water got polluted and you couldn't see anything. So it was just to show the oil pollution in Niger Delta and other parts of Nigeria where uh, oil was discovered without much uh, attention to the environment, but just to like keep uh, getting from it without giving back to the environment, you know. So next one. This is also in reference to that. This is called Wealth of Nation Part 2, which is Ogoni 9, which is also uh, referencing the um, nine activists, including a, a writer and um, environmental activist, Ken Sarawewa, who was uh, hung um, by a military junta, um, um, Sani Abacha, uh, in November 10th, 1995, you know. So it's somebody that I studied uh, his, his work, his literature in school when I was an undergrad. So it was, it was, it was a bit personal for me, you know. So it's actually, really one of those painful things whereby you are saying that your environment is being violated and you are being killed for it you know so the drums which is a different version of wealth of nation this was in poland and also in germany so these are this has two iterations one was in dresden in germany and another one in poland where this was also shown with the trough now filled with um, kind of like blood color um, you know to show and the, the whole earth being scorched at the bottom of the trough that you are seeing, you know. So 
uh, again, I bring my writing and my iconography and render them in different ways, but the language is the same. So it's like, if you have your language and style, how do you use it to write poetry? How do you use it to write novel? How do you use it to write open, you know? So uh, when you see the iconography in different things, you will know they are my work, but they are rendered in different things and in different form. Next, please. Same thing from a different angle, next. We, um, we talk about the boneyard and again, this is referencing culture. How do you begin to, uh, this particular piece was made from steel. This was done at the um, uh, Nairox uh, Sculpture Park, which is in um, about 45 minutes drive from Johannesburg in South Africa in 2016. And it was shown in, the, in an exhibition. It's a, uh, a sculpture exhibition in 2016. It was my first, uh, uh, out of size uh, sculpture that I made uh, to represent a masquerade from my place as well, you know. So growing up, there are certain out of this world masquerade that your, your grandparents would describe to you as a kid, you can't even begin to imagine them. So when you see them in real life, they are, they are larger than life, you know. So I wanted to create something that is a little bit larger than life. It's quite, it's like 6.2 meters um, and also it shows that no matter how big a masquerade is it moves from place to place and funny enough this particular sculpture has moved to three different spaces within south africa since it was created in 2016. first it was at nairox it moved to nova foundation which is a new fairly new uh, museum in Cape Town, now currently is standing in front of the Zags Mocha, which is the waterfront, uh, v and waterfront in Cape Town. So as huge as it is, it can move. It shows the mobility of masquerade in, uh, in, in my tradition. You know? So next, that is, that is it in its old space. Next. So I also talk about tradition. What is, uh, this was a piece or an installation that I made in uh, 2016 as well at the, uh, at the Biennale, at the Dakar Biennale, which is in Senegal, which is the first Biennale that I attended in my continent in Africa. So most people ask me if I have a favorite work um, among what I've done. I, I think this is most, uh, I think I like it a lot because it happened in my in my continent because I've done quite some works, phenomenal works, I would say, in other places. But this was the first time I've having the opportunity to um, to hang out with my fellow African artist, um, curated by the African curator Simon Njamin in 2016. So to actually being able to create this piece, which is not too far from where this piece was created, it was not too far from. Uh, what you could call uh, the sea where slaves were, you know, taken and transported to what you would call the new world, which is the America, you know. So I titled it The Prayer Room because I, I, I had a feeling that that is a place where if people were trying to escape uh, being enslaved, this is a place they probably would run into and pray that they will never be caught and a kind of a solace place for them. But it's also reminiscent of a place places where I first encountered art in my village, which is like the shrines and uh, places where elders we meet to deliberate on issues uh, that are happening in the village, you know. So this is one of those pieces that is a bit seminar for me in, in, my, in my career, you know. So next. Uh, this is another one of my, this is what I presented. It's called a biography of the forgotten. This was uh, created in 2017 when Nigeria went to Venice uh, Biennale for the first time, which was curated by uh, Denrele Shonarewo, uh, co-curated as well by uh, Emmanuel Duma with other artists, Peju Alatiche and uh, Kudu Sonikeku, who is a dancer. Peju is also an artist and also uh, a sculptor. So three of us were um, selected to represent Nigeria for the first time. And this was my presentation, which I called a biography of the forgotten. So it was an homage to uh, what you call the people that have been making art before uh, my time, you know, so it was, it was a celebration of what had come before me. I reference history a lot, I reference culture a lot, and I reference uh, what you call preserving um, 
and respecting what came before you, which is something I think um, the Neo Museum is about, if you ask me, because they are trying to make sure that a part of history is not destroyed, but respected and know where uh, whatever you are seeing today that is probably computerized and stuff, there were things that were made with hands, there were magics that were made with hands instead of computers, you know. So with this one, I, um, I went back to Benin and created miniature uh, bronze heads to represent the Benin bronzes and uh, draped them also on the canvas and also the mirrors that you are seeing, the colored round stuff are mirrors, which was what the colonial masters and the uh, traders, you can move to the next one, it's the same thing, you know, so which colonial masters exchanged for things that were more durable. We all know that mirror is not durable, so they gave mirrors. So the disingenuous nature of how uh, Africa was treated during colonialism kind of also reflect in this, uh, in this body of work. So um, that is what this meant. I, it had some issues when in the place we are supposed to show the work because the host uh, said that the the works that that was the work was fetish, you know. So when we asked, it was because he was seeing the bronze works there. So my point then was, when when colonialism was sacking every part of Africa and taking all their artifacts, they didn't feel it was fetish. But now that a contemporary African artist is referencing it, suddenly it becomes fetish, you know. So. Um, but we still went ahead, the curators and other uh, artists and uh, supporters of the Biennale supported the whole thing. So I didn't have to change my body of work that I was presenting. We just had to look for another place to present the work. Next. And that shifted me in 2017 to kind of start looking at how do you totemize, how do you upgrade certain things and downgrade certain things. When you see a bronze from Benin, you are saying that it's fetish, but when I see a rosary from Vatican or Rome, uh, it's upgraded. I'm a Catholic, I was born a Catholic, you know, so, but I had two traditions. I grew up under a traditional home, but I also grew up in, in other Catholicism. I went to Catholic school and stuff, you know. So I started using rosary, the prayer rosary to make works um, that, are, that you could consider African art or, or Art from my place. I first, I first started using them to represent uh, the kings, the way you would see a king dress. So, um, in this sense, I'm retotemizing. So, what conversations are those people that said that my work was fetish? What conversation are they going to have when they see that I'm now using rosaries that you introduced to us? Rosary is a colonial construct for us, you know, because we had our own totems of remembrance, we had our own totems of of worship. So now that I'm using rosaries in large quantities, some of them sometimes they could be up to 10,000 uh, rosaries, single rosaries that are hand sewn into uh, lace or canvas, you know. So uh, I presented this, this is called Sense and Sanctums, which was uh, presented at the first uh, uh, Stellenbosch Trenale earlier this year in, uh, in South Africa, Cape Town as well. Next. Um, in 2018, early 2018, um, I, created um, what you call angels and muse. Because I mean, I go to a lot of residencies. Uh, there are people that set up these residencies for us to be able to create work, um, safe place to make works and do what we need to do. So I decided to create one as well in Lagos, which is my city where I live and create work and have studio, you know, so that other artists uh, within the country, within the community and outside the community, both artists, writers, curators are welcome uh, to the space where they can stay and walk out of there. Sometimes there's also an exhibition space uh, that they can show some of the young artists and even older artists can show there, have installations there, things like that. So I created this and it was documented by Netflix uh, in 2018. So it came out uh, May, 2018. Uh, under their series, um, Amazing Interiors. You know? So I created it and I worked with a local architect, Tosin Yoshinawa, who um, helped in rede redesigning an old office space to make it livable and um, um, doable. And I invited other artists to, to, to come and, you know, have their work be part of the creation as well. So the stained glass that you are seeing on the windows uh, are by Isaac Mokbae, who is also an artist from um, 
you know, from my place, you know, so we're kind of like, uh, you know, brothers and we work together sometimes, you know, so he's the one that created. So in another room, so there are two rooms, there is a bare one, there is this one that is the signature room. So he has his, um, he has his um, stained glass on the windows. To, to, so it's a collaboration because growing up, making artwork wasn't necessarily one person in the community. You have to call everybody if you are building a house, you have to call everybody and um, they work with you. So that was the essence I was also bringing into this place to bring other people to work with me in, in creating the space for other people to call it that in that sense of the word. Next. Um, so have I worked in trying to reinterpret uh, text before like I'm going to be doing at the Neo Museum where I will be creating some works, um, some drawings, some large scale drawings, some installations, some, I'm going to be working with lights as well, creating some Neo uh, art for the first time, you know, so, but the question was, have I created, um, have I referenced books before? Yes, of course, but this was also one of the bigger projects that I did in South Africa in 2016 by referencing a text by Alex Laguma. Alex Laguma was um, um, a South African author and also he was a journalist at some point, you know, so who, whose first book uh, was uh, a walk in the night, looking at race and apartheid situation in, in South Africa, the race relationship between the blacks, the white, and what they would call colored. Colored in South Africa is not the same. It doesn't have the same meaning as it has in the United States, you know. So, um, so, but he was not allowed to publish this book because it was quite uh, what you call. There was a lot of things were suppressed in South Africa back in the days uh, during the apartheid and even before then, you know. So when he wrote the book, A Walk in the Night, he couldn't publish it in the in South Africa, so he published it in Nigeria under the university press in Ibadan for the first time. So I also encountered this book uh, very early uh, when I was in college uh, in my teenage years, you know, so I read, I read it and it was quite fascinating. So it was my first entrance into South Africa, even though I had not traveled to South Africa then. So in 2016, when I had the opportunity of traveling there for the first time, I decided to reference that um, that particular book by, by drawing some of the characters or imagining some of the characters, the interracial relationships that they've had um, in, in the book and what resulted, the violence that resulted from such uh, things back in the days. You know? So again, I'll be looking at, um, during my stay in, 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 um, at the Neo Museum as, as the 2020, uh, artist in residence, I'll be referencing another book. Um, I like referencing books because I mean, as a writer, this is how I see so between both uh, practice, you know, so I read a lot of other artists, um, other writers books, I write as well, you know, so how do I manage, how, how do I be a bridge or how do I uh, manage both uh, practice? Um, this is practically how I, I do I do that because um, I will be referencing or part what what people most people would say point of departure would be uh, neon vernacular which is by Yusef Kumoyaka you know so um, yeah it's neon vernacular neon vernacular I mean when I, when I got the neon museum residency, the first book or the first thing that came to my head was Neo Vernacular. I mean, if you read about Yusef Kumayaka, he was, uh, he was he's a veteran uh, of, the, of the Vietnam War, you know, so he wrote a Bari, he wrote about race in this book. He wrote a very interesting uh, book of poetry. He won the Pulitzer in 94, but I studied it when I was, when I was at the University of Maryland doing my MFA. So one of the, one, one of these, uh, poems that really, I can say, relate to Vegas for me. Not that he was writing about Vegas, but there are sometimes you things that resonate for you when you do certain things, is um, or when you read certain books and visit certain places. Uh, the title of the poem is called "A Good Memory," and I'll read a little bit of it. Our city of lights glowed when there is darkness. The field at halftime and a hundred free jack girls matched with red and green pen lights fattened to their white boots. At, as the brass band played, it don't mean a thing. They stepped so high, the air tasted like 
Jasmine. So he's mostly referencing lights here. Um, you know, so I'm going to be looking through a lot of where he referenced lights that I can reference as well when I'm making the works that I'm going to be making. And of course, I'm going to also be working with and interacting with local uh, poets from, uh, you know, different part of the of the community in uh, in Vegas, you know, so I really look forward to to this residency. And um, I think that is it in a nutshell. I think we can take some questions um, now, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. We have some comments coming through. People have um, really appreciated what you've been sharing today. Um, if people have questions, please do add them to the, the chat there, the Q&A, and we can address those. So could you please tell us the title of that book again? It's called The Neo Vernacular. You can see it, Yusuf Kumayaka. And Almi says, thank you for sharing your beautiful work with us. What would you say is your greatest inspiration? It's, I mean, a lot of these questions have been asked, I guess a lot of, life is an inspiration itself the more you live the more inspiration you get you understand you know so uh, but i would say growing up in where i grew up which is very steep in art form from performance arts to poetry to um, sculpting to to architecture and stuff like that because a lot of people tend to for lack of better word to be blindsided by the fact that you know, there's a lot of art that was that was being made or created, or we had our process of of consuming art before the Western world uh, interacted with us uh, in the continent. You know, so a lot of those past ways of doing things um, are, are some of my influences. And how did they do it? How did they reference things? You know, you can look at an old sculpture and suddenly somebody is standing by it and you think the person was a model for it, but these sculptures were made like 100 years or there about ago, you know. So, which means life as it was unfolding was also an inspiration for the artists that came before me, you know. So, um, life itself is, is very, um, you know, influential for me in that sense of the world, you know. So, but there are multiple things that can come at the same time depending on what I'm working at. So, you know, as I was preparing for this talk, I realized that I'm not definitely the first Nigerian to uh, to reference uh, <laughs> to reference Las Vegas in their work. You know, a very good friend of mine, Chris Abani, has actually written a book in 2014 called "The Secret History of Las Vegas." I mean, he 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 didn't write it from a distance. He 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 was engrossed in the city and. He kind of brought so many things, brought a South African character with a local character and um, actually explored the city. So in that sense, you could say that the city influenced uh, Chris Abani at that particular time. Because if you were to ask him what influenced your work, he's not gonna just pick only that book, but there are multiple things that eventually uh, culminated into that particular time, you know, so yeah. We'll have to add that book to our research library. You have to definitely, yes. it's amazing, it's amazing. And uh, what was the name of the second and third art pieces that we showed? So I think those were the installation pieces. What were the titles of those again, please? Um, can, uh, um, to be very sure of what we are talking about, Steve, can you reassure the, the last ones, please? Yep, second and third pieces. Uh, go back, go back. So this one, are you going, to, is it going too far? This one, is this what you made, Joe? I think it's just a little further back. We're just reversing back through. So yeah, to the, this is the third piece, right? Okay. <clears throat> so this is, a, this is, this, no, yeah, he's going up. Should be going down towards the end, right? Uh, yes, I think this is next so this one is, after. This is the making, okay, so let's just go through it. You know, so this is the making of um, um, the prayer room. This was when I was painting it because the entire place was painted, hand painted. 
you know. So I had um, some local friends that helped me paint the whole place black before I started putting my iconography on it. Next. This one is called Wealth of Nation, 2015, Indonesia. Next. Wealth of Nation, Ogoni 9. Ogoni 9 are the nine activists from Ogoni land that were, that were executed by uh, Sania Bacha, who, who was a military dictator in the 90s. Next. Same from a different angle. Same, Ogoni 9, Wealth of Nations. Isima Godo, the unknowable. Same. The prayer room with sculpted canvas. Next. A biography of the forgotten. A biography of the forgotten, 2017, Venice Biennale. Next. Sa Saints and sanctums, Saints and sanctums, South Africa. This is just, um, this is Angels and Muse. This is one of the rooms in Angels and Muse, which is, um, which is the residency space in Lagos, Nigeria. Wonderful. So thank you, Victor. We have a question then. Can you speak to your community collaboration efforts and your upcoming workshop with local students? So we have the college, Southern Nevada. Yeah. Nevada State College, and they are looking forward to also learning some more with you in, in the workshop um, in relation to the what you mean to me. Um, I think we have to like figure out, okay, what is, the, I mean, when we first started this whole uh, proposals and what we're going to do, I don't think that anybody ever envisaged that the world was going to be this crazy, you know, so, <laughs> you know, so, um, Safety wise, we're going to be very, very safety conscious. I don't know if we're probably going to do that uh, via Zoom or if we're going to do uh, social distancing, but it's going to be like um, almost like a writing workshop slash how do you, how do you get um, inspiration from art to write poetry? You know, so we can look at something like that. Why does art influence your poems or how does art influence your writing? You understand, you know, so or what is your writing style or, you know, so some of those things we are going to cover and see how um, if if it's physical, then we might go at some drawings and just allowing some of the poets to actually like um, do some drawings and just leave them to like air out and switch switch from that writing mode that intense mode of writing to actually like um doing some drawings with pens pencil chalk charcoal and stuff like that then see what can come out of that what you mean to what you mean to me uh, which is the title of the entire body of work that i'm going to be doing is what what did the neon signs that are now old what did it mean to the people that created them from the artist that created those neon signs to the person that it was created for, to the owner of the space, be it business, be it uh, a hotel, eatery or stuff like that. You know, so we cannot turn that around when you're writing poetry, you know, usually I write poetry for things that have passed, you understand, you know, so it could be a past love, it could be a past country, it could be a past experience, you know, so what do things mean to you when you look at them? You know, so we're in an election mode right now. Tomorrow, this is going to be history. What would that mean to you? What does it mean to you right now? You know, so when, when, I, when I pick my titles, it's always like something that you have to like reflect on and ask yourself, what exactly is this? It's not a one, it's not a one thing. It doesn't mean one thing. It means multiple things. Something that you can come into and pick the meaning for yourself by yourself, you know, so as it relates to you. And it's certainly a very interesting time to have you with us and to have your insights um, also in, you know, with a big perspective of things. So we do have a question um, from Koso. Thank you so much for the talk and for all your insight. You spoke at the beginning about the inherent culture of signage and messaging through art in Nigerian communities, and later about the struggle you, struggle you had with your artwork being considered fetish 
despite it in fact being an expression of your culture and history. Yeah. Do you have this struggle with just foreigners or Nigerians as well? And how do you believe future Nigerian and African artists should tackle the prejudice and misinformation about our traditional um, cult through art? Um, yeah, I mean, there are things we have to realize that what what you are not familiar with will always be strange to you, you know. So, but I'm also one of those that is not going to carry the load of somebody else's prejudice. It's not. It's too heavy. I'm not going to be part of that, you know. So, um, you do your thing. Make sure it's legal. Make sure it's right, and just move on. There are a lot of people that are going to like what you're doing. There are a lot of people that are going to find it not, uh, you know. So, in that sense. You, you can educate people if you have the time to, if they are willing to learn, you know, so there are other places. I mean, there are, I'm not gonna say that in Nigeria, there are people that don't like look at some of my works and kind of shy away from it or, or kind of like, oh, what is it doing? Because we have to realize that um, there was a time when there was a re-engineering. There was a time when our work were said to be primitive, you know, even though that the, Europeans were copying their ass off of it, you know, like you, the likes of Picasso and the rest when they first saw African art. There are people that, that just, you know, they believe that, oh, this couldn't have come out from Africa. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so then also foreign religion came in and things that were, that were just supposed to be uh, family heirlooms, uh, remembrances, portraitures like you could find in a picture in your house. Uh, there was a, a last scale demonization of these things, you know, so we have to deal, artists have to deal with those even at home, not to even talk about foreign dealings, you know, so, but I think that some of these things are not what one should approach with anger, but you should approach them with like enlightening people. There's a lot of enlightenment that needs to be done uh, back home because we need to re-educate people of the importance of this art that they are not what they think they are because other people the works that you are thinking are demo are selling for millions in 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 in, um, in auction houses um, and you are throwing them away you know so or you are you are destroying them or you are burning them how do you tell how do you tell your history how do you know what your great grandparents did you know, so, but for Westerners or any other person, whoever they may be that find uh, they can relate with the work, eh, you know, I mean, everybody, I may not be able to relate with their works as well because it doesn't speak to me. If I meet probably a blank canvas on a wall in a museum and a lot of grammar is being spoken around it, um, I could walk away from it because it's not telling me anything, but to maybe a Western audience or something that blank canvas is probably saying something to them you know so i mean it goes both ways you know so yeah thank you so suzanne actually asked could you define what you mean by the fetish a fetish object i don't know what they meant what they meant is that they just want the they see it, they see blackness they see color they see skin it's not coming from where they expect it to come from so it makes them already uh, it, you know, I mean, sometimes it's like getting an elevator, you know, so I lived in America for the longest time, you could get in an elevator as a black person or somebody that is there is already clutching things. So there's a preconceived notion, uh, notion that my skin color could give off and that cannot be devoid of the work that I'm creating, you know, so Again, I'm not going to be going around making everybody comfortable. So if you are not comfortable, I'm not the one that is making you comfortable. You have things that you have to deal with, you know. So that is none of my business, you know. So uh, whoever saw the work as being fetish, that is purely, purely, purely their baggage to carry, not mine. Right. And and uh, Timmy asks, what is the secret behind your being able to wear so many hats effectively? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like um simple way of just staying out of trouble i mean i, I do i believe in doing we, i grew up in a village where we didn't have toys we, you can't go to a store and say you are buying toys right so you have to create things yourself which is what is exciting for me about the neo museum whereby you can go and be promoter again be a child again i just play with things and create stuff you know so I, I grew up creating my own toys i grew up creating my own masquerade i grew up creating my own 
small tree houses that you go to Costco here and go and buy a tree house for your kids. No, we created them. We go into the forest, we bring the things. So we learned architecture growing up. We learned how to make artwork growing up. So you can decide to take that and continue with it like I did. I was lucky enough to have stuck with it and grew with it. You know, so like I said, again, with the writing one, I actually went to school to read, um, I read English and literature and I have an MFA in creative writing. So that you could say that I studied, you understand? I, it was, you know, so I, I have to do both of them, depends on my, or what I want to express and the kind of expression um, or, or subject matter that I want to deal with that I feel like, oh, uh, maybe visual art cannot quite accomplish or express what I want to say, then I switch to writing, you know? So is, is in the village, you, you grew up doing everything yourself, you understand, you know? So, and there is that possibility that you grew up actually like um, not being lazy with some of the things that you are gifted with and just decide to express them and have fun with yourself first. If the world finds it interesting, um, that is interesting to me as well. Wonderful. We have quite a few questions coming, coming in, so we'll try and get through a few more. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so Doyen says, the nexus between oral and written literature and the immersion in your various art forms is striking. It resonates. How do we ensure that this thoughtfulness is transferred to the next generation of artists? Uh, that's why we are documenting. I mean, we have multiple ways. That's why archiving is very important because I'm one of those believers of archive, archiving things and um, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching my kids to like make sure they don't throw away things as well because when they grow old and they become parents as well, you know, so, you know, I just discovered my father's archive recently. I revisited it again, you know, so we have to document. That, that did a number us, on us as a continent because we didn't document, we, be, we believed in an oral tradition. So you can see that when we are saying stuff now, somebody is gonna say, oh boy, it was not written down. But because it was not written down, doesn't mean it wasn't true. But the Western world were able to start documentation in a different way in the written form, but we documented orally. Then at some point when there is this migration from rural to urban, then that, that communication began to break because you are no longer telling the story the way it used to be, where you tell the person, the next person carry the, next, the story to the next person. So um, I'm, I'm, it's a clarion call to other um, African artists, other African writers that we should be documenting as fast as possible. Um, you know, so luckily enough, I mean, social media is there, but I don't know how, last, how long lasting something else is gonna come and take over social media. Um, I still believe strongly in writing things down and documenting things. So with documentation, with history, one person can't do it all, you know, so we need art historians, we need curators, we need uh, archivists, we need um, uh, institutions to like document some of the things that is coming out from the continent and other parts of the world. So that way we're able to move it from generation to generation. Wonderful. And Devan, Devanti asks, were you hesitant to share your work and create new work with new countries or was it something you wanted to do eventually? Repeat that again. I didn't hear it. What, what was it? Were you hesitant to share your work and create new, new work with new countries or was it something you wanted to do eventually? I think it's something that I like doing, not wanted to do, because I mean, different places speak to you differently. You understand, you know? So if, I, if I'm, where, while I'm in um, Vegas, Vegas is gonna speak to me differently, you know? So, and I can, can feed off of that energy. I usually don't just dive into making works whenever I go to a new place. I'll probably spend like um, a few days, depending on how long I have, you understand, you know? So um, I'll spend, you know, like what energy is the place feeding off of? What, what kind of energy is the place giving me? Uh, I work with a lot of energy in a place, you know? So if I go into a place and the energy is wrong, then I may decide not to do any work there and just like, no, you know? So, but there are some places that is really, uh, the energy is, the vibe is right and everything. And I just go at, I just go at it. So it's fun to actually create works. I mean, I'm showing you different works right now and probably a few of them are the ones that are created back home you know so they are created in different countries but they are like it's my way of telling you this is where i'm coming from uh, and also telling you about my place whereas it's a global conversation that we are having but i'm also telling you my part of the world that you may not be privy to 
here is be educated, be enlightened. Don't be so monofocused on where you are because you think um, the moon only shine in your, in your compound, as we say. It's, the moon is global. Well, we do hope you will find very good energy at the Neon Museum in, in, in Las Vegas. So um, far, so great, you know, so yeah. <laughs> well, we're delighted that you will actually be able to physically come to Las Vegas this time and, and spend time here. This is not your first visit to Las Vegas, though. Can you tell us a little bit about your previous um, experience? I here? know that. I know a lot of people, <laughs> I know a lot of people that don't live in Vegas or when they hear Vegas, the, the only thing they think of is the street. But I happen to have a friend there who lives in North Las Vegas, um, um, a family friend. I've known him for, for, for more than three decades, you know, so you could say childhood friend who lives there with the family. So every year that I'm in the US, I'm, I'm, I'm in Vegas for at least, at least one week, you know, so, um, you know, so it's, it's kind of like a second home in a way for me because I will always visit if I'm, if I'm, if I'm in the US um, and um, just go around, see things, see some shows. Um, thankfully, I don't gamble, so that is not, <laughs> so I don't go, <laughs> I don't go looking for slots, uh, slot machines, you know, so, but I like the city. It has, it has a decent uh, energy when it's not too hot, you know, so, and there are other places there that one can just hang out and uh, have fun, you know. We do have a question about where people could purchase your artwork. Um, at the moment, um, probably, you know, they can, you know, are we be able to share that in, um, at the moment, nothing is getting sold at the moment. There's, there's a moratorium on that for now, but I will let them know in due course, they should just uh, follow the social media and. Um, they will know, you know, so, but they can send a message to my studio, you know, so through my social media handles. You know. and certainly at the moment, um, if people have questions um, after the talk today that they would like um, us to also forward to Victor, um, we can put our email in here, which is programs at neonmuseum.org. So um, that's just in the chat. So absolutely, um, please do also follow up with us um, after this session today. So um, I think we also have one more question that might be for Joe and Victor. Um, when will Victor's pieces be on display at the Neon Museum and how can they view them? Well, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> We will be um, also having an open studio event on December the uh, 17th, right, the Thursday. And um, at this time, we're looking at doing that as a restricted, you know, numbers in person um, opportunity. But we will also um, make a connection online uh, for folks who can't be here um, in person and taking into consideration the restrictions that we're working under and we will also be uh, following developments um, of what Victor will be doing while he's at the museum um, through our social media, um, our website. Um, we can put the website in the in the chat as well, the Neon Museum's website um, with our education programs, our Facebook page, Instagram and um, so we will absolutely be following um, Victor's adventures here in Las Vegas while he's here. Is there anything else? Sorry, Victor, but you would like to add to that? Um, no, I mean, I really look forward to it. I, I wish the um, I wish the, the world was a little bit uh, sane health-wise, you know, so it would have been nice to, to have a lot of my friends, old friends and new friends come and visit the Neo Museum as well, because <laughs> it's quite interesting from what I've uh, seen so far and um, the, 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 the works that I'm going to be doing there, you know, so yeah, you know. Well, we're so happy that you're able to physically come and um, enjoy the, the Neon Museum, uh, which is open to visitors um, with restricted numbers, but, you know, taking all health precautions. So. The museum is open. We certainly welcome people to come and experience the, the collection and the space where Victor will be working, the NETN studio, 
also has um, items of our collection there as well, which are not um, on view generally uh, to, the, to the public. So um, Victor, you will be getting an inside, inside view of the big picture. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are some fabrications that we're gonna be like making and, um, you know, so hopefully we're able to like um, accomplish those because I mean it's, it's going to be a new form for me, but it's not a strange form for me, you know. So the idea of working with light is um, is very interesting for me because of the significance of it, you know. So uh, I tend to uh, explore that very much so, and and also the the space at Jewel, you know. So I look forward to that as well because I mean it's going to be like a two studio. There is a sculpture studio where I'm going to be working at the end ten which is the Neo, uh, another part of the Neo Museum, you know, which they showed earlier. So I really look forward to that for the much larger uh, body of work that I'll be making. And at the Jewels, which is in downtown, um, I also look forward to like probably working late nights there um, in the mm -hmm. studio there because I'm, I'm going to be living in, in the space, you know. So it's, you know, it should be fun. I mean, City of Light, you know, so um, I love lights, you know, so <laughs> it should be cool to work there, you know, so, and I look, I really look forward to it, you know, so, and, and I also will be showing the world and my friends and um, followers um, the, the beauty of neon that I've seen, the beauty of neon museum. I mean, not very many people would think of it as an art form, but it's something that I know is an art form and, a, a little bit of something that people don't know about. I was so desperate to be an artist as a kid that I would go and sit with somebody that writes signs, a sign writer. <laughs> and I wanted to apprentice with him, you know, so I'll finish school and, you know, after classes, I'll go and sit with him as a kid. That kind of like went on for like three months before my dad was like, no, it's not, you know, you need to do other things right now, fix your book, you know, so, but, you know, here we are, Years later, you know, I'm going to be working in a museum that is solely dedicated to the art of uh, neon, you know, or sign writing or sign as a form of art, you know. So uh, that I definitely look forward to. You know, so yeah. Also, thank everybody for taking the time to join us today via Zoom, and we will definitely be also connecting. Um, you're all in on the December 17th open studio event. Um, we'll share online experiences as well. Um, and meanwhile, if you have any further questions um, for Victor that you'd like us to pass on, programs at neonmuseum.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I want to thank my, my people from everywhere in the world, especially my Nigerian friends that are that are staying because it's late there right now. So thank you all. And uh, thank you, Randy. I know you are there somewhere. Thank you, Joe. Emily, of course, I look forward to like uh, exploring your archives, you know, so it will be really cool. Uh, Steve, thank you, who is the magician behind this scene, you know, so appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks all for joining us. 2020 Artisan Residence, Victor Ahi Carmenal Studio, it's not open for visits, but project updates will be shared on the Neon Museum's website, neonmuseum.org and via social media. The Neon Museum Boneyard is open with tickets limited for social distancing. Schedule in advance. 360 virtual tours are also available at neonmuseum.org slash virtual tour.